In this Northern Brewer video, expert advice on defeating diacetyl, the dreaded buttery off flavor that homebrewers most commonly experience when brewing and fermenting lagers and dry hopped ales. We're joined by Dr. Laura Burns from Omega Yeast Labs. She explains what diacetyl is, how it's formed, which yeast strains and beer styles are most vulnerable to it, and the more traditional methods for preventing it. Then she tells us all about Omega's new innovative DKO yeast strains, engineered to literally knock out diacetyl. Before we get into it, if you like these technical discussions and want to see more expert Q&A on all things fermentation, please like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share it with all your brewing buddies. What's going on, everybody? It's Chip Walton. I'm here in Northern Brewer HQ in Roseville, Minnesota. I'm joined by Laura Burns, R&D Director, Head of All Things Awesome at Omega Yeast Labs. How are you doing, Laura? Thanks for having, having me on. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're here to talk about a very important, often frustrating topic among pro and home brewers, which is diacetyl. Boo, diacetyl, boo. But I was also thinking as we were ramping up to do this, I was like, but also sometimes, yay, which you'll talk about a little bit or at least expected. Let's just start with what diacetyl is, where in the brewing and fermentation processes it comes from and how someone knows, literally knows if they have it in their uh, beer. Well, so... Just to break it down on a high level, you can have diacetyl from two sources. One, just general yeast fermentation. It's a flavor that yeast produces. Or another source would be contamination. So known beer spoiling bacteria, lactobacillus pediococcus, they, they form diacetyl. Um, sometimes dirty draft lines lead to diacetyl. But the major source of diacetyl that we're going to talk about today is yeast fermentation. Um, Typically, you won't see much of this um, in a finished beer, but it certainly is produced all the way through fermentation by yeast. It's part of their metabolism. So it's actually um, what's known as a vicinal diketone. And that's why a lot of the time we refer to it as a VDK in the brewing world. Like people will just say our VDKs are low or our VDKs are high, but that's just um, a vicinal diketone, talking about the actual chemical structure of diacetyl. When diacetyl is in beer, it's actually in pretty trace amounts, but it can be still very noticeable. So a typical diacetyl measurement is in the parts per billion, which is pretty hard to detect by instruments, but your nose is much better at detecting it. So um, yeah, it's kind of one of those just quality parameters in general that brewers really try to avoid producing or having beers with diacetyl in them. Um, but like you mentioned, Chip, there's some cases where diacetyl is present and it's not necessarily frowned upon. So some t traditional styles like uh, uh, English bitters or even Czech lagers will have diacetyl present in them at low amounts. And it can be a benefit to the beer, sometimes adding a roundness and a, and a mouthfeel and having like an overall um pleasant effect in the beer, but at high levels, it's really off-putting, it's buttery, you can notice it like right off the nose on a pour and you just like right before you're even taking a sip, you might even turn away from it. Um, so that's definitely the level we're trying to avoid and make sure that, you know, you have the best representation of your beer and the aromas from malt, hops, yeast that you're trying to highlight. It's often called, well, you said butter, it's kind of buttery what is it? Do people call it like fake popcorn butter, right? Like artificial butter almost? Yeah. It, and actually the um, manu like the popcorn manufacturers with like microwave popcorn actually use these compounds to flavor the um, popcorn. It's actually that imitation butter flavor is diacetyl. So even if you want to know what it's like, go to the store and buy that popcorn butter and it'll be pretty obvious to you. <laughs> And its mouthfeel is, is it's kind of slick-ish, right? Or round, it almost like mutes, crisp, bitter. So you can kind of tell if your beer has that too, if you're not getting this expected layer of those things. Yeah, and even, you know, depending on how sensitive you are to diacetyl, tasters sometimes don't notice the aroma from it, but they notice the mouthfeel change. And that slickness is something that kind of 
um, triggers them and gives them an indication that it's in the beer. Yeah. My wife who works at Summit Brewing is a, is diacetyl super sensitive. Uh, so they bring her in like to, t- to break ties often in sensory to be like, hold on, let's bring in Elsa. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually, those people are super valuable to have at the brewery because sometimes it's, it's questionable and you just, instead of having the equipment, you might just have the person on the team that really gives you a yes or no, which is pretty cool. There's two scenarios where this kind of really kind of comes to light. Um, diacetyl is an issue during lager fermentation or just lager process and also dry hop fails, which I had never really thought about until starting to read all of your articles and technical stuff about hop creep. Can you talk to us kind of about both of those and how people who uh, who deal with them, what they do as a technique to kind of prevent it and work around? Uh, well, one of the things, I'll just start with lager brewing. Um, lager brewing is somewhat, you know, often just regarded as more challenging because you're really relying on these to produce an extremely clean profile. There's not much malt and hop profile to hide behind. So the fermentation has to be extremely clean. Um, so when we talk about thresholds for diacetyl, lager beers often have a lower perceived threshold where people can pick it up at smaller amounts. So that's just one reason why lagers are a little bit trickier. But the other reason is lager fermentations are a little bit more difficult to manage. You need to have, you know, the right cell count going into fermentation. It's often maybe double the amount that you would use for an ale fermentation. You're fermenting at lower temperatures, which limits the amount of growth that that yeast has during fermentation. And when it's kind of underpitched or at low numbers during fermentation, some of the off flavors become more present. So diacetyl is one of those that kind of, if you have a really cold, long, slow fermentation and, you know, you're really pushing the yeast to kind of do its job, diacetyl sometimes becomes more apparent and becomes more of an issue. Um, So yeah, lagers, they tend to be a little bit more tricky to deal with. That's when, um, yeah, we kind of work towards recommendations like a diacetyl rest. In a lager, you would um, maybe go through the majority of fermentation at the lower temperature where um, you're trying to limit the amount of esters the yeast produces and get really clean fermentation profile. But towards the end of the fermentation, you can actually raise the temperature. Even up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit is a, is a good amount of temperature raise on a lager. Um, and it just helps the yeast get real active at the end of fermentation and clean up the rep the rest of that diacetyl that was formed during fermentation. So it kind of like all of the um, process kind of just gets accelerated at higher temperatures. They're just a little bit trickier just in yeast management. So they t- they're they not, not the lager yeast are more prone to diacetyl. They're just brewed with a, in a way that promotes the formation of more diacetyl. Um, and, you know, especially when you're home brewing without the equipment to count the yeast cells. Um, I would recommend doing a starter flask of your lager strain to really make sure you got you have a good uh, pitch rate going into the fermentation and nice healthy cells starting it out. And ales have the same problems. If you don't have great yeast management, you're going to have diastole issues with ales too. And some strains are more prone to diastole. So that would be like your English bitter strain. That's definitely one known to have like a higher amount of diastole. And that tends to um, correlate with yeast that flocculate really hard and really fast. Mm. Um, so yeah, sometimes it just happens in ales too. And the diacetyl rest is another helpful tip. Um, just raise the temperature at the end of fermentation to help clean it up. Um, and then for dry hop beers, this is something that basically took the industry, the professional brewing industry by surprise when we all of a sudden started increasing the amount of hops we were adding to the cellar with like massive dry hop loads. And with those hops actually come enzymes, enzymes that are kind of the same enzymes that you use in the mash to break the um, stored starch of the barley down. Um, you're, you, those enzymes that now have access to the rest of that you didn't convert in the mash at dry hop. So beta amylase, the same mash enzyme that we usually use for conversion is in the hop itself and leads to um, some breakdown of the the dextrin base and then re-fermentation. So the re-fermentation and activity of yeast when it's already kind of finished its job is definitely a time when you get a massive diacetyl spike. And that can happen 
after packaging. So sometimes you get it in the keg and you have it oh, cold yeah. and sometimes that still is forming in the package. So that's definitely one of those things. Brewers, professional brewers, if it's leaving the brewery and diastole is forming in the package, that's a, a huge headache. So you might yeah. not recognize this at the time of packaging, but it might sneak up on you later. Um, and one of the reasons behind that, if we get down to the science a little bit more, the way that diastole forms is actually through kind of like a pathway. Basically, the yeast is releasing a compound into the beer called alpha acetolactate. And when that compound is in the beer, it's spontaneously converting to diacetyl. Once it converts to diacetyl, the process is kind of finished and the yeast has to reabsorb it and convert it into another compound that's not aromatic. So that's how the yeast is operating and clearing diacetyl during diacetyl rest. So that process itself will always happen if you have healthy yeast. And um, during hop creep, you can wait it out and get through that diastole bump without um, having the beer be ruined. The yeast will continue to clean it up. Um, and kind of segue into like these strains that we're going to talk about in a few. An enzyme in the brewing industry has kind of been out for a while to help prevent that um, precursor, the alpha acetolactate, from converting to diacetyl. The enzyme is called alpha acetolactate decarboxylase. Big word. ALDC is what we call it in the brewing industry. And, and so it basically takes that compound the yeast releases and pushes it right through to another compound ca called acetoin and avoiding diacetyl altogether. So it's, it's literally knocking out diacetyl, preventing the formation of diacetyl. Um, it's, it's a very effective tool to limit diacetyl from the start. So in a dry hot beer, some people will add the enzyme at the beginning of fermentation, and then they also add it at the time of dry hop. And that can kind of help to mitigate some of that diacetyl that forms during fermentation and during hop creep. Um, and for a lager, really, you just need to add it right at the beginning of fermentation and it, and it really reduces the diacetyl enormously, uh, super effective in lagers. This is part of why we're also seeing more brewers kind of put that dry hop load even earlier in primary fermentation, like mid fermentation is, is that because kind of the standard old school way of doing it after fermentation was really like, there's not enough left of this yeast to clean up what this hop at the very terminal end just reintroduced. Yeah, yeast kind of get into their hibernation mode. Even if they're still alive, they don't really want to wake up and reconvert these compounds. So it's better to do it when they're active in the middle, of like kind of late fermentation timing. When you're still seeing some fermentation, the bubbling might be happening in your bucket. Get your dry hop in then, um, and it helps to kind of make it all happen at the same time and avoids that like restart. Um, it just kind of continues to happen throughout fermentation. So there's diacetyl rest, there's dry hopping earlier, there's adding this enzyme. These are kind of like the current and previous ways of dealing with diacetyl. But now Omega has something very cool, the DKO. These just showed up at Northern Brewer. We're super excited to have them. These kind of do the heavy lift of both the yeast and the enzyme. Can you tell us all about DKO? Yeah. So... I mean, the whole point is to make beer better quality and make it easier on the brewer for a lot of the things we do, whether it be education or ladies, these type of products. But um, the yeast that we released as the DKO series, all are engineered to include the enzyme. And that means that during fermentation, as the yeast is pushing out all of this alpha acetolactate, it's actually being converted all at the same time to acetone. So it never even makes it into diacetyl. So yeast is really the whole package. You're not worried about the enzyme addition anymore. The yeast has the enzyme and um, it all coincides and happens at the same time. Even if you're using, like if you wanted to use this yeast again in your next home brew, you could harvest it off, store it and use it again. That enzyme is always going to be expressed. So instead of having another kind of, 
product on hand and having to worry about when you dose it and how you dose it, the dose rate, the yeast just takes care of it all. You don't even have to think about it anymore. It's certainly more of a peace of mind and it kind of saves you from headaches that you would get if you were dealing with diastole forming during hop creeper in a lager. It isn't a band-aid for bad yeast management. I would still <laughs> absolutely encourage you to do your starters and make sure you got the best kind of like stepping forward into that beer, you're getting on the right start, get your yeast in the best health. Cause there's other things you might have to worry about. Diastole is one off flavor, but another one we commonly talk about with poor yeast management is acetaldehyde. And it's kind of like a green apple note, sometimes cut, pu cu cut pumpkin. And those kinds of things will still happen. Um, even if you're getting rid of the diastole, you just really more as an effective like peace of mind and kind of keeping you from dealing with the longer um, timelines that you might see on a lager or that hop creep that happens regardless of how happy the yeast are you're still going to potentially see that happening so these dko yeast keep all of that at bay and all you have to think about is you know getting normal fermentation also our um, west coast l1 strain is super like a big offender of hop creep one, because everybody <laughs> likes making West coast IPAs, but two, it also tends to kind of peter out of end of fermentation, have a harder time clearing diastole with hop creep. So um, yeah, that one definitely will be more prone to diastole and should, you should get a big advantage out of that one using the DKO version. And we should mention yeah. these have already been on the market. These have already been on the market for pro brewers and been very popular. So it's another example of, Home brewers speaking up, raising their hand, being in the community with pro brewers and being like, why can't I get that? Now you can get that. <laughs> For sure. We saw it immediately once we had these strains out. We had a, a massive load of comments that were just super excited to see it at homebrew. So it's cool for us <laughs> to have this out to homebrew. I know like, we kind of have a leg up on the commercial side because it's just, you know, we do it all the time. We have repeatability. We've gotten it refine the process so much, but it's hard to always hit the mark home brewing. And I think these will just make that process all like more smoothly. So happen more smoothly. So really excited to get it out to home brewers. Also worth mentioning though, uh, they're, they're going to be very clean. So if you're actually aiming for a, say a style guideline kind of version of brewing, you're entering a beer in one of these styles, check pills, you mentioned, or ESBs, you might want to consider using the mother strain. I mean, when we were doing a bunch of our test brews and, and developing these strains, um, we had to kind of force it and under pitch, under aerate, or um, even prematurely crash the samples to make it obvious that the diastole was there with the parent strain. So you should still get great fermentations without DKO yeast, but it will make sure that they're absolutely clean without diastole. And um, I don't know. I, I, pr I would definitely still prefer even to style examples with like amounts of diastole that are appropriate. I would still prefer them without. So it kind of comes up down to what you like. Um, I'm not going to complain if I have an amazing Czech lager and there's a little diastole in it, but yeah. I'd probably go to my best efforts to make it without. <laughs> Again, this is really to just make diacetyl not even have a way to get in there yep yep knock it out <laughs> that seems like a giant step forward for sure uh thanks for joining us and letting us know where diacetyl comes from many ways both traditional and now uh innovative ways to defeat the dreaded diacetyl uh, we're gonna have these Strains available at northernbrewer.com. Definitely come over, check them out, pick them up. Let us and Omega know what you're doing with them and kind of your experience, both sensory and just joy of brewing. Laura, thank you so much. Always awesome. You guys are super helpful, very transparent. We will also link your windfall of resources in the video description below. Thank you so much. Awesome, guys. Thank you.